Uh, welcome everybody to the Asian Impact Webinar on financing a green and inclusive recovery. And thank you everybody for attending. Today's topic is a uh, highly relevant for developing Asia's efforts to build back better or to build a more sustainable future uh, as the uh, COVID-19 crisis recedes. To kick off the webinar, my uh, colleague, Xu Tian or Grace will present the Asian Development Outlook 2021 theme chapter on financing a green and inclusive recovery. She was the overall leader of the theme chapter. Over to you, Grace. Uh, thank you, Tom. Let me share my screen. Good morning, everyone. Um, this year's uh, theme chapter on uh, for Asian Development Outlook is um, financing a green and inclusive recovery. Uh, I would like to brief, uh, briefly introduce you the key messages. The first message I would like to uh, introduce is that um, um, Asia needs a green and inclusive recovery. The COVID-19 actually highlights some vulnerabilities that the region faced during the pandemic. In particular, we see some vulnerabilities in terms of uh, public health, education, and the, the vulnerable groups suffer more during the pandemic. Another lesson we learned that um, uh, high impact risk, or you call it tail risk, do occur. One of the uh, key risks that the region face is from the climate change. So that's why Asia really needs to build back better and then also gain greater resilience for future shocks. And to uh, mobilize more uh, capital for a green and inclusive recovery actually needs collaboration from both public and private sectors. According to an um, estimate by UNSCAP, this um, estimate was made in 2019, Asia Pacific region as a whole uh, calls for uh, annual investment roughly 1.5 trillion uh, to meet the um, SDGs by 2030. Uh, this translates to around 4 to 5 percent of regional GDP. So uh, it is a huge amount of money. Then how to fill this funding gap is the challenge that the region needs to solve. Green and social finance helps to fill the gap and then uh, targeted the, uh, move the region towards um, a green and social uh, inclusive uh, gr green and inclusive recovery and towards the SDGs. Green and uh, social finance has been developing very rapidly during the recent years, particularly from the private uh, sectors. Uh, so far, advanced economies, in particular the European Union, still dominate the global green and social finance landscape. Uh, but recent years, we do see uh, developing Asia has been making very good progress in this area. Um, the two charts you see on this uh, slide shows uh, the uh, green, uh, green bond issuance and the social bond issuance in the region and then also around the, the world. On the left-hand side chart, what we can tell is uh, global green bond issuance has been steadily increasing and then Asia, which is the blue bar in the bottom, uh, accounts for roughly 20% of global issuance. On the right-hand side chart is a global social bond issuance. We can tell two messages out of this chart. The first one is uh, 2020, the orange, the yellow bars. 2020 sees a surge in global social bond issuance regard in, in all the regions. And then the second message we can tell is Asia uh, is actually the second largest regional social bond market following Europe if we, if we exclude social, uh, supranationals. So this shows um, um, developing Asia is, is actually playing a leading role among the emerging markets uh, in terms of uh, um, green and social finance. And then on top of that, Asia has also made very good progress in uh, regulation and policy guidance for green and social finance. One key question that we wanted to understand is whether this momentum can sustain. Um, what we, our re, according to our report, actually both economic and non-economic factors are driving global green and social finance development. So other than um, um, a motive to achieve SDGs, other than a will to do good, we do see there are some um, economic uh, finance motives uh, that are driving the green and social finance. Uh, here we outline three key factors. The first one is there is a changing in stakeholder preferences in the market. The second is uh, there is also a need to hedge and mitigate um, sustainability related risks. 
And then third is um, there is also a demand for greater resilience under shocks. And then all the factors contribute to the development of uh, green and social finance. This slide uh, shows that uh, financial motives are increasingly driven uh, uh, companies and investors towards uh, sustain sustainability activities. The chart on the left hand side um, is actually uh, evidence in our report. It is uh, Australian empirical evidence. What we uh, observe is um, after Australian rectified the Kyoto Protocol, uh, high emitting Australian firms witness an increase in financing costs for both debt and equity relative to low emitting Australian firms. In particular, according to our estimate, uh, after the rectification of Kyoto Protocol, high emitting Australian firms, they see 5.4% uh, increase in cost of debt relative to their uh, low emitting peers. And then for equity, the increase in the cost of equity is 2.5 relative to low emitting Australian firms. And then uh, there are several factors contributing to the increasing in financing costs. For example, uh, investors are getting more concerned about lending to them. Uh, so the credit available from major banks declined. And then also uh, these firms see greater risks in their operations too. So all this contributes to their uh, increased cost of uh, financing. At the same time, what we observe in the market is uh, firms' um, sustainability-related activities helps them to gain positive recognition among investors. On the right-hand side is another uh, study in our um, overall project. We show that uh, after Asia's uh, companies issue their uh, announce their green bond issuance, what we observe is in the uh, capital market, in the equity market, their common stocks witness a 0.5% um, abnormal returns during the 16-day um, window around the uh, green bond issuance announcement. Uh, this number might be small, but if you translate it into an uh, annualized number, it is um, actually 8% annualized abnormal return. So it's, it's not uh, a small number. Um, another issue that we might want to ask is whether the green and social finance are able to really make a difference. Are they really associated with some real impacts? Um, so we also try to addre address these concerns in our study. Um, this slide shows that green finance seems to be able to send a credible signal of a commitment to environmental impacts. What we observe is that at the firm level and market level, green bond issuance is associated with the overall improvement in environmental performance. On the left hand side chart of the slide, it is um, uh, empirical evidence. At the firm level, Asian green bond issuers companies, they show improved uh, environmental performance after their green bond issuance. In particular, their uh, environmental performance increased by 17% during one year after the green bond issuance. And then this number increased to 30% increase in environmental performance during two years after the green bond issuance. And then at the market level, what we see is on the right-hand side chart, you can see after a market witnessed their very first green bond issuance in the market, the overall CO market level or country level CO2 emissions uh, posted some declining trend. So. Um, uh, our evidence shows that if we observe the sample period between, between 2010 and 2019, uh, the reduction in CO2 emission is 0.37%. Uh, uh, and if we uh, increase the, the sample year from 20, uh, 2000, 2000 to 2019, the decline in CO2 is, is, is further. It is by 0.77%. We wouldn't argue that the, uh, the green bond itself will contribute to this amount of CO2 reduction. But what we, can, we wanted to argue is uh, um, the issuance of uh, green bonds actually sends some overall commitment or greater awareness of the company, of the country, that uh, there is an increasing awareness to do good, to move towards SDGs. And then also the, there is a commitment to improve their environmental um, performance. So that is what we read from this uh, uh, evidence. Uh, when we turn to social uh, impacts, actually compared to environmental uh, impacts, social impacts tends to be more diverse. Uh, other than social bonds, 
um, we also witness another uh, useful instruments that in the market called the uh, impact bonds. Impact bond is not a fixed income uh, assets like uh, social bonds. It's more like a partnership between investors, service providers, and outcome payers. So on the right-hand side chart, you can see investors pay the capital and the service providers implement the uh, project. And then after that, there is an independent evaluator trying to evaluate the performance of the projects. And then the commissioner or the outcome payers will decide based on the performance of the uh, project, uh, whether they pay or not to pay for the investors. So this is a um, um, type of design of this partnership tries to ensure the uh, impact can be delivered. One notable example of this uh, social impact is uh, social impact bonds. It's uh, the Educate Girls uh, Development Impact Bonds in India. Uh, it, it is uh, quite a success because it achieves both financial returns and then also uh, social impacts targeted. Uh, we also noted that there is um, a, um, a opportunity that multilateral, uh, multilateral development banks that can help to catalyze uh, capital for green and uh, social finance. In particular, uh, MDBs can help so participants in the market via direct uh, investment, via co-financing, also while providing innovative financial solutions. At the same time, MDBs can also help to develop the market itself. For example, MDBs can help to build market infrastructure, enhance ecosystem. MDBs can also work closely with the public sector in terms of uh, policy making, capacity building, and then on knowledge production. Uh, there are multiple funding sources and instruments that helps to catalyze uh, private capital into the market. Um, for example, physical revenues is always very important funding sources. According to a study um, in the US, actually after the global financial crisis, the US green stimulus packages are able to guide the recovery towards uh, cleaner uh, growth after the GFC. And other than that, we also see instruments like microfinance, which provides uh, a basic financial services to um, underserved groups. And then also there is another useful uh, instruments called carbon pricing, including um, carbon tax and the emission trading systems. On the right-hand side chart, you can see the region actually sees a growing momentum in using carbon instruments to um, reduce the uh, carbon emission and then also uh, to move towards a low carbon transi uh, transition. The last slide um, or the last section of our study is about what we can do to further develop green and social finance and then to help uh, the region to achieve uh, a green and so uh, inclusive recovery. So largely we observe two large type of policies. One is how to guide private capital into the market. So the, pol uh, the public sector can align finance with SDGs. Um, for example, they can help to develop a standard and disclosure uh, as well as uh, standards of disclosure and then also impact metrics to that is aligned with international practice so that the investors gain more uh, confidence to invest in the region. And then also the public sector or authorities can incorporate sustainability risks into macro and macro prudential frameworks, so as to safeguarding uh, financial stability as well as uh, encouraging more uh, supply and demand into the market. And then also the public sector can foster the development of market infrastructure and ecosystem to further boost the development of green and social finance. At the same time, it is also important that the public sector gain more resources themselves. Um, so they need to strengthen their public uh, finance status. They need to mobilize more uh, resources domestically. Um, for example, um, uh, effective tax policies may help to uh, mobilize more uh, domestic resources and increase revenues for SDG-oriented fiscal measures. So on, on both sides, actually both private and public uh, sides, there are policies uh, policy ro uh, rooms for, for further develop green and social finance in the region. Here is the key message of our uh, study. First, um, Asia needs a green and social, uh, uh, green and inclusive recovery, uh, which requires mobilizing uh, capitals from both public and private sectors. And the rapid growth in the private sector green and social finance tends to be uh, sustainable because it is increasingly driven by um, financial motives. 
uh, there are some evidence confirms that uh, uh, the positive environmental and social impacts of uh, green and social finance in the region. And lastly, uh, public policies is very important to further develop green and social finance in the region. In particular, in particular, policies that will enforce common standard of disclosure and also impact measurement will significantly benefit the market development. Uh, that is the key messages of our uh, same chapter. Thank you for listening. Tom, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Grace, for an excellent uh, presentation. Uh, I have a couple of questions for you from the audience. Dr. Majumdar has this question for you. I think it's about the social impact bond, slide seven. Uh, the social impact bond model is an interesting model. Is an intermediary always necessary? What exactly is the role of the intermediary? Any uh, examples? That's the question. Oh, the intermediary is um, is um, an agent that tries to manage the whole projects. So it is um, it is like a SPV in um, a securitization or, or, or some similar arrangement. It helps to manage the proceeds they received from the investors. It it passes the money to the uh, the service providers to implement. It also involves uh, the independent reviewers to to provide um, uh, a evaluation report and then. A it also uh, try to uh, ask the uh, outcome payers whether they need to pay and how much to pay for the, the for the investors. So it is um, more uh, overall management of the partnership. So it is a link uh, to to all the participating parties. So far, it seems that uh, um, uh, most of these uh, uh, the uh, impact bonds have this intermediary or. Um, uh, the intermediaries to, to manage the whole pro projects. And then of course, how uh, this uh, uh, management can be done is, is actually case by case. It is a negotiation with all the stakeholders involved in the um, impact bonds. I hope this addresses your question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, let me just take another question before I uh, uh, move on to the panel. Uh, so Chiat Eng asks, what roles uh, should the government play to promote private capital domestically and what kind of regional cooperation could be helpful for green and inclusive recovery in Asia and around the world? Grace. Uh, thanks, Tom. This is a very uh, good question. Um, actually, uh, to mobilize more of private capital domestically, um, as, as our study shows, there are, there are multiple actions that the, the public sector uh, policymakers can do. First is we need to foster, uh, we need to foster the demand and supply uh, by if we, if we align the finance with SDGs, there will be uh, naturally many demand and supply. So for example, there are uh, ex existing policies that asking the financial, uh, financial institutions to consider sustainability re related risks in their portfolio. And then this creates demand for green and social finance. And then also there are also policy guidance for companies. Okay, you need to be com uh, compliant with certain sustainability related uh, framework, risk framework, and then that increased supply. So this is from the supply and demand, line, uh, demand side. And then uh, of course, we also need to make the market more ready for them to play in. So there are some uh, very important issues. For example, uh, um, the, the policy makers needs to, um, to work to develop some kind of uh, clear taxonomies and uh, uh, impact uh, disclosure uh, standards, uh, data collection standard, and then also a uh, impact measurement practice so that everybody is clear about what they need to do and then whether their impact is counted. So this kind of uh, uh, guidance is also needed. And then on top of that, we also need a very, uh, 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 very well developed market infrastructure and ecosystem. So we need some external verifiers to provide their evaluation of the impacts. We need uh, um, uh, underwriters that have the capacity to, uh, to do this green and social finance instruments. So we need a complete ecosystem. And then we also need to build this capacity of uh, all the participants in the market. So all this, we need the market there. We also need uh, to foster the demand and the supply. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very 
very much. Uh, let, uh, thanks again, Grace, for an excellent presentation. Let's now move on to the panel discussion. Uh, before we begin, let me just very briefly introduce uh, the four panelists. We are very lucky today have a strong panel of four distinguished panelists. Uh, Hyun Kim or Jennifer is Deputy Director General of the Global Green Growth Institute, which is an international organization based in Korea. It's dedicated to promoting green growth around the world. Caroline Fl Flammer is a professor of strategy and innovation at Boston University, and she has done some pioneering economic research on green bonds. Jason Mortimer is head of sustainable investment at Nomura Asset Management, and he is a well-regarded industry expert on social finance and social bonds. And finally, my colleague Anush Mehta is head of green and green and innovative finance here at ADB, and he leads uh, ADB's efforts to promote green finance in the ASEAN region. Now, let me ask some questions uh, to, to specific uh, panelists. Let me start with you, Jenny. So we all know that the entrepreneurship will have to play a, a major role in uh, promoting green growth. So, uh, and I understand that GGGI, your organization, has a program called Greenpreneurship Program, which I think is the mix of green and entrepreneurship. So how does GGGI's Greenpreneurship Program contribute to greener development in developing countries? Over to you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Tom, for a very good question. Um, as you just mentioned, the GGGI is working for developing countries' green growth. So environmentally, uh, in, in sustainable and environmentally friendly economic growth. Uh, that's GGGI's objective. Therefore, we are helping countries to achieve economic growth. And many countries due to COVID-19, now they, they, they are taking actions to reboost the economy. And during the recovery package uh, and many actions, uh, countries are focusing on job creation, job creation, job creation, particularly focusing on youth. So uh, GGGI's Green Preneurship, it's a program uh, to create green jobs for young people and support the growth of startups and uh, micro and small and medium enterprises in developing countries. So the program is a combination of uh, mentoring and network, network building services, business plan competition, and providing some seed money, particularly to young entrepreneurs. So every year, GGGI and the two other organizations called uh, Student Energy and Youth Climate Lab uh, launch online incubating program for green startups. The program will run for 12 weeks, uh, online webinar and trainings for selected applicants who have innovative green business ideas. And it leads up to a business plan competition. Final uh, three participating teams uh, who are, will be selected uh, will win the prize money and the opportunity to present their business uh, model at Global Green Growth Institute's annual meeting. For last three years, uh, young entrepreneurs from Nepal, Mongolia, India, Indonesia, Cambodia, PNG, Fiji, uh, they were selected and received the benefits of Green Preneurship Program and seed money as well. And GGGI is um, currently uh, developing a regional green preneurship program in collaboration with the Korea Development Bank and GCF. Maybe uh, I have to stop here uh, just to keep uh, the time limit. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Jenny, very clear. Let me now turn to Jason. Of course, you're an expert on a social finance and social bonds. But social finance is a relatively new area, but it's also a rapidly growing area in sustainable finance. So for the benefit of the audience who might not be so familiar with social finance and social bonds, 
please, first of all, define social finance, give us some concrete examples, and also explain why social finance and social bonds are growing so rapidly both around the world and here in Asia. Over to you, Jason. Thank you very much for the question. Uh, so yes, uh, regarding social bonds, uh, you know, the, the ICMA, uh, International Capital Markets Association uh, definition based on the uh, social bond principles is an instrument where the proceeds are uh, exclusively applied to finance or refinance uh, projects with, uh, with kind of a social aspects, a social impacts. Um, uh, and uh, these include, for example, uh, water sanitation, uh, transport, access, affordable housing, health, education and training, digital access, uh, financial services, including um, uh, SME finance, food security, and most recently in the, in the most late, latest update, the uh, social fund principles in 2020, they added um, crisis unemployment alleviation as a category, um, obviously uh, reflecting the, uh, the crisis uh, around COVID uh, that, that we've been dealing with. Um, and and the, other, the other aspect of these, uh, these social bonds um, or various forms of social financing is uh, that the issuer then uh, commits uh, to tracking the proceeds, uh, tracking the impact, reporting on that impact over the life of the bond. Um, so basically what you've got with this, you know, very much similar to the green bond uh, principles, um, is sort of a ready-made impact investment for, for fixed income investors. Um, uh, so they're, they're proving quite popular. We've seen, um, you know, the growth of, of the overall ESG bond um, uh, market, if you want to say, uh, you know, green bonds and social bonds and also sustainability bonds, which are a mix of social and green, uh, has been growing quite a lot. Uh, um, although I would say that the, the social bond market really took off last year in the COVID crisis. It kind of really seemed to find its uh, uh, raison d'etre. Um, uh, basically, issuance was running at about 18 billion U.S. dollars globally for social bonds, uh, and that in 2019, and that uh, kind of rose about eight times uh, in 2020 to uh, nearly 150 billion U.S. dollars globally. And what's quite interesting we found is that actually Asia is a very large source of, of social bond issuance, particularly uh, Japan and Korea are, are some of the largest uh, national issuers um, uh, you know, by, by, by country for social bonds. Um, and I think, especially in the case of, of Korea, I found it quite interesting. Um, we, we actually have published a, um, a, a publishing a two parts a series about uh, social bonds through the ADB, um, uh, both about uh, as a primer and also about the impact measurements. Uh, so please do check that out uh, as, as that is published now and, and will be continue to be published. Um, uh, what we found was that in the case of, of Korea and, and also in Japan, uh, very much an, an agency led um, you know, it's a government agency-led uh, issuance market. Um, there are a lot of issuers in these types of countries uh, that are involved. They have basically, you know, you know one mandate for either um, you know, social social housing, uh, affordable housing. That is um, also uh, various forms of, uh, of funding for uh, for students um, uh, or, or medical uh, kind of uh, related agencies. These are ones that we found have been able to issue a lot of social bonds. Um, and we think that that's a great uh, area of growth uh, that, will, that will develop this market going forward. Thanks. Thank you very much, Jason, very clear. Let me now turn to Caroline. Green bonds are, are very popular uh, around the world these days. Uh, everybody wants to issue green bonds, but the question is, do they have an impact? Do they have a positive environmental impact? So my question to you is this, are green bonds effective in improving the environmental footprints of the green bond issuing companies? And are they effective in financing the transition to a lower carbon economy from a macro viewpoint? Over to you, Caroline. Thank you so much. Um, this is a very, very good question. And let me tackle this question two ways, highlighting on one hand the promises but also the limitations of green bonds. Um, you know, as you already highlighted, and as also Grace highlighted, in the recent years, the green bond market has really experienced a downright green bond boom. Okay, it's very impressive how this market has exploded over the years. Now, my research shows that on average, companies do improve the environmental footprint for limitations of green bonds. Okay, in addition, and importantly, I have also find that the stock market responds positively to the issuance of green bonds, as, as Grace pointed out before in her presentation. 
However, what is important to understand is that these improvements in environmental and financial performance following the issuance of green bonds is only observed for those bonds that are certified by independent third parties. Okay? For non-certified green bonds, uh, in contrast, I don't observe any significant changes in environmental performance nor in financial performance. Now, what does this mean? Okay, so what do, what do these results suggest? They suggest that on the one hand, green bonds indeed hold promise in serving as an important tool in the fight against climate change. In terms of corporate green bonds, this also suggests that these, this is a tool that companies can use regardless of what governments may or may not do. Okay. However, these results also suggest that greenwashing is a concern, in fact, alleged concern for those bonds that are not certified. And let me also emphasize another point and just to state the obvious, and this refers to your kind of the, the second part of your question about the transitioning to a low carbon economy. There's no silver bullet. Okay, so in, in order to transition to a lower carbon economy, I think we need multiple actions, multiple fronts. On one hand, um, we need to further expand the green bond market as the current size of this green bond market is hardly enough to finance the transition to, so what is, you know, what is really needed in terms of financing to uh, fund a lower carbon economy. Secondly, um, it will be important to have a process in place that guarantees that indeed the proceeds are used towards the funding of green projects that really help us and are effective in achieving a tr transition. And last but not least, um, I think we need to secure additional funding. Okay. The green bond market, it's very impressive the, the, the growth it has experienced in recent years and the kind of ESG fixed income market more generally, social bonds, uh, green bonds, climate bonds, sustainability linked bonds. There's a wealth of new kind of ESG type of bonds out there. But um, the green bond market or this kind of ESG fixed income market alone is unlikely to be sufficient at this moment. And let me stop here. Thank you so much, Caroline. Uh, now let me turn to my colleague, Anuj. I think this was the question that was posed to uh, Grace, but uh, she didn't have the time to answer it. So, it's, uh, so let me pose it to you. The question is this, Anuj. Is there scope for regional cooperation in engineering a green recovery? Can you give us some concrete examples of such green regional cooperation here in Asia. Over to you, Anush. Thank you very much, Dongan. And it's a very important question, especially in the region I'm in, Southeast Asia. Um, and, and absolutely, I think there is no doubt about it that regional cooperation is super critical uh, in two or three different ways. You know, one is especially in terms of policy. I think when countries get together to talk about certain policies for greening infrastructure that informs their policies. And when they share the policies across different countries, it allows alignment. A really interesting example of that is the ASEAN. The ASEAN as a body uh, recently, end of 2020, agreed to increase or accelerate, I think two or three times, their targets for renewable energy to 23% by 2025. I mean, four years or three years from now. And that is because they work together as a body trying to figure out what are the policies to improve greening. And that really has a knock on effect on national policies in greening. And we see uh, Philippines creating a green finance task force or a green force. Um, we see that happening in Thailand. So this is a very important knock on effect in terms of creating the momentum between countries when they sit and talk together. Another example, which is critical, I think is a, re is a regional approach to de-risking or financing. And the great example of that is the ASEAN Catalytic Green Finance Facility. It's a facility which is owned by all the 10 countries. All 10 ASEAN countries sit together, they meet twice a year, uh, and they basically have funds invested, which are supposed to de-risk projects, create a pipeline. I think there's already 22 projects in there, four already approved, it was set up about two years ago. 
73,000 tons emission reduction. But the most important thing is that the governments through this vehicle have all agreed that they're going to use the money to leverage six, seven, eight times capital from private sector for every dollar of government money used. And that responds very importantly to Caroline's issue that green bonds alone are not sufficient. Uh, and to what Shu Chan was saying earlier, that you know, when you need 210 billion just for Southeast Asia or 1.5 across uh, Asia for SDGs, you know, you need a lot of capital to be leveraged in. I'll stop over there. Back to you, Dongguan. Thank you so much, uh, Anush. A very clear response. Now, let me pose a question to all of the uh, panelists, uh, because I think it's an important question. I think it's an question asked by many people uh, when they, when, uh, who are interested in sustainable finance, in green and social finance. So the question is this, and this is directed to all panelists. So please feel free to jump in and uh, respond. The question is this, there's a widespread perception whether it's true or not, there's a widespread perception that green and social finance is only happening in rich countries, in advanced countries, US and uh, Europe and so forth, and not really relevant for developing countries. Is this true? Can you please uh, explain if it's not true? So any panelists, please uh, feel free to uh, answer. Hello, Tom, can I come in? Sure, Jenny, please go ahead. Yes. Um, frankly speaking, no, I don't agree. I think that's just a perception. And um, the, the perception is changing, I believe. Uh, and actually, more and more developing countries, actually, they are taking very active actions for green finance mobilization. Because I know because GGJ is, is helping those countries to mobilize green investment and green finance in, do, in, in, in the countries. Uh, for example, uh, we supported Mongolia to establish green finance cooperation, so-called MGFC. So MGFC is a national financial vehicle to provide mortgages for green housings, energy efficiency, and um, thermal installations. So MGFC actually uh, mobilized finance from local banks and GCF as well. So GGGI supported, uh, supported the MGCF to develop a GCF, GCF project proposal. And finally, uh, they succeeded uh, to receive 27 million loans, guarantee grant and equity from that fund. Uh, we, we, we are also supporting Vietnam to issue green bond, and there are many other examples. Uh, therefore, I believe there are opportunities in developing countries for green investment and green finance mobilization, and the amount and the volume and the market size are increasing. So I believe uh, there are new opportunities in developing countries regarding that matters. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, any other panelists want to take this question? Anuj, please. Thanks, thanks, Dongguan. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, you know, absolutely uh, in line with Jenny, uh, you, almost two things you said, relevance to, uh, to, uh, to developing, and second is the interest in developing countries in doing uh, green finance. You know, relevance, absolutely. I mean, the fastest growth in terms of consumption, energy emissions will necessarily be with countries with large populations, which countries which are also affected by large coastlines. Uh, and those are countries in Asia. I mean, the populations in Indonesia, India, China, as the consumption trends go up, if it's not relevant here, where is it relevant? So it is certainly relevant. Number two is in terms of interest. And we are increasingly seeing countries in Asia. So China has got a net zero emission target. One of the fastest growth in wind power was in India with their policies. Uh, Cambodia had a, one of 26 bidders for their solar park project in 2019, 26 bidders, one of the lowest power purchase tariffs. So every country in Asia is working very hard towards 
green projects, green bonds, creating green policies, and it is extremely necessary. When I just look at Southeast Asia, you've got some 600 million people living on some of the longest coastlines. Climate change is going to affect them more than perhaps most other countries. So if it's not relevant here, I mean, you know, where is it relevant? So absolutely, absolutely necessary. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, uh, Anuj. Now, let me turn to a question from the from the audience. Uh, it's uh, for Jason on social bond market. The question is this. So far, Asia's social bond market is largely dominated by public sector issuers, and it's dominated by advanced economies like Japan and, Repub and Korea. So what are the bottlenecks for private sector issuance and what are the bottlenecks for uh, middle income countries? In other words, uh, countries that are not advanced. Go ahead, uh, Jason. Thanks very much. It's a really good question. One that we have actually tried to address uh, in the uh, social bond uh, report series uh, published through the ADB that I mentioned earlier. Um, you know, it is true, uh, you know, not just in Asia, but in the rest of the world that, uh, that the social bond market is still very much a uh, agency or kind of a, you know, what we say SSA sovereign uh, um, agency kind of a led market. I think about 50% uh, or so of total total social uh, bonds outstanding right now fall into that category. And it's actually something that we saw um, uh, in the green bond market as well at the early stages. You tend to see uh, you know official um, government agencies uh, it, you know start to issue in this market, and then later on. Uh, the private sector uh, picks up. And in fact, now in, in the green bond after a few years, um, I think in, in, in 2018 or possibly 2019 was the first year in which um, private sector financials and corporates uh, issued more than the, uh, than the government side. Uh, and so I think, I think we'll come along to that um, uh, in, in, in the social bond market as well uh, with, 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 with some time. Um, I think that one of the issues a little bit with, with the social bond market is that um, uh, a little bit different from the from the green bond market, which is very much you know I mean green projects tend to be very um, you know physical infrastructure in nature. I mean energy uh, being being a, a major one. Um, social bond projects tend to be more I mean they're social, uh, not necessarily about kind of a building you know physical infrastructure, but more um, you know again you know well, now I guess it's being called social infrastructure, whether you agree with that term or not. But um, uh, it's not necessarily something that uh, that can kind of uh, you know that, that you're building up, um, uh, but it certainly you know is, is an investment that takes place over time. So it is well suited to the social uh, to, to the to the, to the you know, debt debt financing. Um, and I think what will really be the unlock will unlock the key for more uh, corporate and financial uh, private sector financial uh, issuance, which we would love to see from the from the from the market side. Uh, I think we just need more imagination. Uh, from, uh, from, 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 the, from the corporate sector, from the private sector. I mean, there are a lot of areas in which I think if we really think about it, um, you know, the private sector is contributing to social uh, and, and green uh, kinds of impact goals. Um, and we've seen a lot of innovation in this, in this space. I mean, one of my favorites, I think from last year in Japan, um, a pharmaceutical company uh, in Japan, basically they, they manufacture pharmaceutical, uh, you know, APIs and, and other kinds of medical devices. They issued a social bond last year in order to kind of, um, you, know, uh, you know, add the resiliency of their supply chain here in Japan uh, for, for building um, uh, and, 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 and manufacturing kind of APIs and, and other sorts of components that go into the uh, medical supply chain. Uh, obviously a hugely important uh, issue um, as we've seen, uh, you know, in the, especially in the early stages of COVID um, crisis. So, you know, finding out ways in which your, your company or the private sector, uh, you know, contributes to these goals and then issuing a social bond against that or a green bond or a sustainability bond, I think that um, uh, there will be a time of, of a lot of uh, you know, experimentation, but the market is really, really uh, keen on seeing more issuance in this space. And especially on the social side, I think that there's, uh, you know, it's been pointed out by some of the investment banks now that we, we've had a lot of green bond issuance, obviously much more you know, is possible, but uh, there's relatively more of an imbalance in terms of demand and supply on the social side. And I think that you will see more investors uh, really, really come around to tapping on the social side as well. Uh, which is which is such an unexplored uh, area, I think, still uh, on the uh, on the sustainable finance market. So I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Thanks a lot, uh, Jason. Very clear. Uh, question from 
Iskander Abdullayev. It's directed to, to Jenny. Uh, quite clearly, uh, Jenny is the right person to answer this question. The question is this, GGGI is, uh, has started activities in Karak region, that means Central Asia, especially in Uzbekistan. So what is your target for promoting green energy or supporting cleanup? I think it's supporting cleanup of Aral Sea disaster. I'm not sure how familiar you are with these micro issues, but uh, anyway, please uh, describe uh, briefly GGGI's efforts in the uh, Karak region or Central Asia. Thank you, Tom. Um... Yes, GGGI uh, just launched its operations in Uzbekistan, actually this year. Um, we were approached by the government to help their RRC area restoration. And uh, GGGI jointly with Uzbekistan government, we developed a project proposal for COICA funding. COICA is Korean International Cooperation Agency. Uh, and we, we succeeded. Our focus on COICA projects in uh, RIC area is mainly uh, regarding like sustainable uh, landscape and, and, and sustainable agriculture restoration. So um, uh, we, we, we help particularly the village people to restart uh, climate resilient agriculture and tree planting in those areas. And also uh, we will combine the renewable energy uh, as well in, in the projects. Uh, I'm not, I cannot go to the details uh, to the very technical issue. However, this is, and, and the volume is not covering all areas of RIC because we all know that actually RIC crisis is a huge crisis and just one organization, couple of, uh, uh, a couple of projects cannot, cannot solve the problem. However, we want to start focusing on a very limited specific uh, villages to restore uh, climate resilient agriculture and tree planting to provide like sustainable, sustainable uh, livelihood to the ro local village people. Yeah. Thank you, Jenny. Now let me direct this question to Caroline, who's been a little quiet. But this is the question from Priya Malebenur. So the question is this: How are green bonds financing, green bond financing, different from? not for profit financing, non-profit financing. So I'm unsure whether I understand the question correctly. Um, in a sense of green bonds can be issued by several different entities, correct? It could be government issued green bonds. It could be municipalities issued so, green bonds. So, so I guess the question is how, how is, is green bond financing non-profit financing? And uh, not necessarily. Um, it could be corporations, uh, for profit corporations that issue green bonds. Um, so so let, me put, you know. let me put it to you another way then. Is, <laughs> a, is a green bond financing profitable? Is it uh, economically uh, in, self, in economic self interest? Okay, this is a different question. Um, so um, that's a good question, right? Is it? What, what, what is the value to the issuing company? Do they benefit from it? And this is precisely one of the questions that I, I um, research on. And I find that, so on one hand, you can look at it as what are the financial implications, but also is it potentially a cheaper source of capital? So the financial implications are that indeed the stock market reacts positively, suggesting that the issuance of green bonds is value enhancing. And that it is a signal of more sustainable business practices moving forward, which can be very much beneficial in terms of improving the financial operating performance in the long term to the company. Now, a potential reason, and this is often raised by, you know, by um, when I when I present the uh, question that is often raised by the audience is, well, is it just a cheaper source of funding? Is it cheaper for, for companies to issue green bonds? And that might be the reason why they issue them. 
Now, there are several studies that look at the cost of capital and there is no evidence suggesting that it's a cheaper source of funding. So all to say that, um, you know, overall the results suggest that it's not about the, um, um, that it's cheaper to raise the capital, but it's really rather the positive, positive impact on the stock market, the positive uh, um, subsequent financial performance of the companies are related to improved, more sustainable business practices moving forward. Now, let me uh, uh, turn to a question that was emailed to us yesterday, uh, Dr. Man BK from Nepal. I think it's a good question. Uh, it's about relevance of uh, sustainable finance for poorer or lower income countries like Nepal. So the question is this, green finance can fuel sustainable recovery. However, in poor countries like Nepal, the government is more focused on growth promoting infrastructure projects which can degrade or harm the environment. So in countries like Nepal, lower income countries like Nepal, how can we change the mindset of policy makers who tend to prioritize growth over sustainability? And what can, this is for you Anush, what can international agencies like ADB do to help to change their mindsets? Ooh, very good question. Uh, <laughs> let me let me answer that. You know, this is this is fundamentally important because uh, uh, this goes to the heart of of what we're trying to do in 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 our work in in ASEAN, certainly. Um, and you know, the you know, I'd like to start with a slightly dramatic answer to that, which is yes, okay, great. Let's let's uh, let's push growth rather than sustainability, and pass on the problems of climate change and the non-sustainability of our environment to the children and the grandchildren. So let's look at many of the cities in Asia where this is happening for many years and the incidence of number of children being born with asthma, with lung problems is massive, massive. So it's not even an academic answer. The, the a result is very clear for years and years of putting growth or, or let's say investment over sustainability. Uh, the, the results are very clear in terms of health and climate issues already. So uh, there is no question that there is no uh, answer for anything other than a sustainable approach for two things. One is the impact on climate, the health and related aspects. So I put all the SDGs there. One needs to think about the impact of a particular project on the use of water resources, on the use of or the impact on pollution. There's no point in creating uh, many miles of expressway if it's going to result in massive air pollution, better to create a mass transit system or an LRT system. So that is the, the spin-off. The other side is financial sustainability. So if you don't focus on sustainability of the finances going into a project, the focus will be on just building something rather than running it for 30 years. And that creates a problem every few years in terms of the funding needed for something which is not thought through well. So the impact is, is essential. There is no question that it has to be a sustainable approach to every project that is created. Others, you're simply pushing the problem down. What we are doing as a multilateral, and I think all the multilaterals have this responsibility which they're working on, is that we look at safeguards on every project. So in evaluating any project that we're working on and in giving guidance to governments where we work, we look at environmental social impacts for every project. We help the countries create their own environmental social management systems if they're not already there, as well as including aspects such as climate impact, uh, gender impact, to ensure that a project is well developed from, from this sustainability perspective. And either at a project level or at a program level, for example, we've got a green recovery program now supported by the Green Climate Fund, the first in Asia, in, in Asia, that creates this, you know, four approach, sustainability of finance, sustainability of climate, as well as environment and social, which will be created and, and, and put into every single project that we, that we create. I'll stop over there. Back to you, Dombon. 
Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, we are almost out of time. So uh, let me do the following. Let me ask each of the four panelists in the following order. Jennifer, Caroline, Jason, and Anush to a uh, concisely, very concisely, one minute maximum, give your views on what is in your opinion, the most important issue or barrier or policy in financing and uh, a green and inclusive re recovery in Asia. And also after the four panelists, Grace, you'll please also give a one minute view, viewpoint. So uh, let's start with Jenny. Um. Regarding green recovery uh, and green finance mobilization, I believe like strong political willingness is crucial. Yes. So market is, uh, I mean, the private sector, they are, they are looking for a good place to invest. And there are a huge amount of money globally uh, going around to find, to, to, to find a good place to, to put, put their money. Therefore, when the country has a very, very strong political commitment to go green, uh, of course, that commitment must be equipped with like regulations, strategies, development of targets and roadmap, many other, other things. However, once the commitment is there and if, if the government is giving a very clear signal to the private sector, then money, private companies, they are coming in. So strong political commitment, that's the crucial one in my view. Thank you, Jenny. Caroline? Let me try to focus on two challenges. Um, one is the lack of public governance. Okay, so what is important to understand is in most countries around the world, with the exception of India and China, um, the green bond market or kind of the ESG fixed income market is there's no public governance. Um, so in other words, the greenness of the bond is typically not binding from a legal perspective, which opens up concerns about greenwashing. Um, the second aspect is, I think it's, it's also important to highlight that, that um, you know, green bonds may help, may, may, may hold promise in serving as an important tool in the fight against climate change and helping us in the transition to a low carbon economy. But this does not mean that it helps us to ensure a just transition, meaning a transition to a low carbon economy without worsening social inequalities and injustice. I stop there. Thank you, Caroline. Jason, please. Yep, so I think uh, from the market side, we certainly wanna see more uh, diversity of issuers. Uh, we wanna see more uh, participation by the, uh, by the private sector in these markets, green and social. Um, I believe that uh, probably, you know, as, as the first speaker said, um, you know, a push by the government side, uh, you know, setting up the right frameworks, having the right governance uh, structures in place, um, encouraging kind of agency issues to, to grow the market first will be a, an important first step. And within, with regards to emerging markets, uh, you know, middle income, lower, lower less developed economies, um, I think there, there is still a very big concern by the, by the um, investors about, uh, you know, the trustworthiness of the data. Um, you know, can uh, will 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 the will the impacts be uh, be reported on correctly? Um, and there's a lot of work I think happening on on the private on, on the market side for how 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 to uh, how to solve those kinds of problems. Either you know maybe involving MNDBs uh, to help facilitate um, uh, you know the, the, the data, or possibly looking at new strategies through let's say uh, sustainability linked bonds. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Anush, please. Thanks very much. Uh, the biggest issue, in my view, is the lack of a scale of bankable project pipelines able to attract the private capital needed. The financing gap is 60% of financing requirements in most of Asia. For that, capacities of local governments really needs to improve to understand structuring of green and innovative projects and creation of these de-risking funds. I'll stop there. Thanks, Anush. Grace, please. Um, in my views, I think, uh, yeah, as uh, Carolyn just mentioned, I think uh, the market institution uh, quality still needs to be further strengthened. And then also uh, we, we need uh, standard taxonomy, uh, impact measurement, and then a reporting system, as well as uh, uh, continuing the com commitment from the government to uh, continue to push towards this SDG uh, finance. Thanks. 
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, before we close, we've come to the end of the webinar. I'd like to thank uh, all the panelists. I'd like to thank Grace. I'd like to thank the uh, Asia Impact Webinar team. And of course, I'd like to thank uh, the audience for attending this webinar. Before I let you go though, I'd like to uh, very briefly advertise our next Asian Impact webinar. So we'll have a webinar on a digital entrepreneurship for economic resilience on uh, two weeks from now, 26 May at uh, 4 p.m. Thank you everybody and have a great day. Bye, thank you.